Hi, welcome to part 11 of the Lackawanna Cutoff, where today we're going to talk about sidings on the cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And here we are at what was at one time called Westport Morris. I'm actually standing on the New Jersey Transit track that has been installed which only goes a, a few hundred feet more beyond this point west uh, to a, what will be a grade crossing. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a future episode about New Jersey Transit Rail Service. But in terms of sidings, this wasn't the siding. This, this was the westbound main of the cutoff. Now, as I'm going to move over here, where I'm standing now was the eastbound main of the cutoff. And I move on a little bit further. And this was passing siding, which started roughly about here and continued up to Port Morris Junction, which is at this point about a little bit over a mile away from this location. Now you would think, well, okay, the, we're talking about sidings and that's a rather obscure or uh, somewhat um, uh, unusual topic to actually devote an episode to, but sidings on the cutoff, as in any rail line, played an important part in the operation of the line. Now, when the cutoff was built, which you know, harkens back to our previous episode, part 10, there were a total of roughly 14 miles of sidings, passing sidings now we're talking about only, uh, that were installed on the cutoff. In today's video we're going to visit each one of those. But in the bigger picture you think, okay, well that's 15 mi 14 miles, 15 miles. Um, there was maybe about a mile or so, maybe a little bit less of sidings at the individual stations that were devoted to actually freight sidings, not for the purpose of having uh, a, a freight train pull off as would happen here, an eastbound freight coming up the, the grade, go off onto the siding here, might go into Port Morris Yard uh, through the wide track or straight going east towards, um, towards Hoboken. But sidings played an important role uh, because it enabled the free flow of traffic primarily for the purpose of passenger service because even though the cutoff was, was built for high speed, that was primarily helpful for westbound traffic. Eastbound traffic, it was a little bit different. And there were times and places along the cutoff, this being one of them, where there was a, a half a percent grade, which could be substantial depending on the size of the train that was being pulled by a certain locomotive. Now we talk about the main line, you figure out from point A to point B, Port Morris to Slateford, 28 miles of track. It's really 57 miles of track if you think about it, 28 and a half miles in each direction. When the line was built, um, there would be a truncation in 1958. We'll talk about that, but um, you figure that even with that 58 miles plus the 14 miles or 15 miles of sidings, there was also the old road which played a role. Even after the cutoff opened in 1911, the old road would take some of the spillover, shall we say, of traffic and would actually be used as I don't know if you want to call it a siding per se, but as a way of channeling additional traffic so it didn't have to go over the cutoff. The classic example of that was the, the train that, uh, was, uh, that uh, became a victim, shall we say, in the Rockport wreck, where that train was originally scheduled over the cutoff. If there was no rush to get the train from Chicago to uh, Hoboken, so what happened was the train was rerouted over the old road and, and, and wrecked uh, just south of Hackettstown. But that was a case where if that 
for some reason, that train did not come over the cutoff because, at least the way the story has been told, the information we have, is that there was a freight train or some sort of freight traffic that was going eastbound that was tying up the railroad and therefore they didn't want that train sitting behind that freight traffic and since there was no rush for that train to get to Hoboken anyway, it went uh, over the old road, which um, unfortunately had tragic results as it turned out. But in terms of the operation of these different sidings, we'll get into them individually, but in, in, the, in the bigger picture, uh, which we'll discuss, is that we'll find out that apparently after these sidings were actually installed, I mean, they were part of the, the building of the line, they find that not all the sidings were useful, as it turned out. Uh, apparently this would be something that would become evident over time because if you look back on the way the sidings were actually uh, configured, you'd really wonder why they do this, why do they put a siding here? We'll discuss as we go along and try to figure out, because there isn't a lot of information out of why they did this. Uh, so some of this is going to be conjecture, I have to say, or speculation, but uh, in any case, what we'll do is as we visit these individual sidings, we'll try to make the best as we can out of the sense of why the, the Lackawanna installed these individual sidings and what purpose they serve. Some of them it'll be quite evident, like at the stations there was, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious what their reason for them being was, but um, a, a couple of them it's going to be a little puzzling and we'll try to do the best we can as we go along. So here we go, our next stop is going to be West Port Morris, but West Port Morris at a later time. West Port Morris, we're talking here, really was from 1911 until about until 1958 when the cutoff was single tracked 1958 uh, Westport Morris is actually moved and that'll be our next stop here we are at Westport Morris I could call it the new Westport Morris as of 1958 what happened after 1958 is that at this location the two tracks which came down from our previous location we're now west of that location uh, the what I'll call the old Westport Morris. The two tracks came and then combined into one using the eastbound right of way. So now we, what happened from here west, 1958 now we're talking, was that the westbound track ceased to exist. It was torn up uh, with a couple of exceptions, um, but we'll, we'll get into that as we go along. So, um, maybe I'll just say for just briefly about why the, 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 the track or why the cutoff was single tracked in 1958 and why they chose to remove the westbound track. By the way, we we're looking in the distance towards New Jersey Transit. We were here this in the previous episode uh, on building the cutoff. Um, but that's the westbound track, that's what New Jersey Transit has uh, chosen to use the westbound side of the right-of-way to reinstall track. But uh, back in the 1958, the Lackawanna was looking at consolidating with the Erie. That would still be two years off, but in 1958 they were looking at combining as many facilities as they possibly could. Hoboken Terminal, uh, they were also looking at consolidating trackage in New York State. But they also looked at single tracking the cutoff. Now the story I was told by Bill Herkner, who worked for the Lackawanna in those days, he then subsequently worked for Conrail and he also became um, uh, part of New Jersey Transit later on. And that's when, uh, when I uh, met him and talked to him about this. He said that the, the Lackawanna was looking trying to decide, well, should we take up the westbound track or the eastbound track on the cutoff? And you think, oh, well, what kind of scientific method did they use to do that? Well, it wasn't all that scientific. They actually, what they did was they, they according to Bill, they kept an eye on how through 1958, whenever it was they finally were going to make a decision, what was the condition overall of each track? And at the point where they actually had to make the final decision as to which track was going to come up, 
they determined that the eastbound track was in slightly better condition. So they decided we'll take up the westbound track. And that's what happened. That's the way it was determined. There wasn't any, um, any special type of decision making that went into it other than that, except that how they determined which was in quote unquote better shape. So that's how they determined which track was going to be taken up. So this became, um, as of 1958, West Port Morris, where two tracks went into one, an eastbound train would have gone onto the, would have stayed on, to, well, it would have gone onto an eastbound track. Uh, west of here would have been both an east and westbound track, but east of here would have gone onto the eastbound track. Westbound trains would have come down the westbound track and gone onto the single track. So that's West Port Morris, the, the, the new West Port Morris. Our next stop is just going to be up the road a piece here. We're going to walk a little west and we're going to look at Roseville Siding and I'll, dis I'll discuss that how it got its name, although it's not as obvious as you may seem because you would think, oh, it has something to do with Roseville Tunnel. Uh, yes, but we'll, 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 we'll see. Well, next stop, Roseville Siding. Here we are at the eastern edge of what was called Roseville Siding. Now, to orient you, uh, this is westbound, uh, this is eastbound. Actually, at this location, there was both an eastbound and a westbound siding. Uh, this will be eastbound, this will be westbound. So in other words, there were a total of four tracks here for one mile. The, the sidings weren't exactly the same. One was 1.01 miles long and the other one was 1.05 miles long. But essentially one mile from here to one mile west would have been the location of the siding. To orient you, we are at this point just about two miles west of the original uh, Westport Morris, which West Port Mars is now a, a mile from Port Mars. So at this point, adding all those numbers up, we're roughly about three miles or so from um, actual Port Mars Junction. Now the question is, why did they build a siding here? And why did they call it Roseville Siding? Because the tunnel actually at this location is really uh, several miles away. Uh, the thing is that it's, it's because it was probably the closest thing that was um, uh, an actual landmark, they might have decided to call this Roseville siding for that reason alone. That's the only possible uh, explanation that, that possibly can be. But the question is, well, why did they build a siding here? Actually, in a sense, two sidings because there's east and west bound. I'm just going to move over here to what would have been the siding. This would have been the eastbound siding, as a matter of fact. Actually, I have to be over further. Well, I'm not going to go that far. I'd have to be over in the weeds to actually be in the east, but this is actually the eastbound track, and that would be the eastbound siding. Why did they build a siding here? I can't really answer that other than to think that they thought that eastbound trains and even westbound trains would have needed a spot I'm talking about freight trains now, would have needed a spot to pull over and wait for a passenger train. Now, the, the, the only way that would have been done would have been what by would have, would have been called um, train orders. Back in the day, and we're talking now, this siding was at best probably in operation for maybe 20 years or so. Don't know exactly. Doing some further research, which we might or might not be able to provide, but um, it's somewhat obscure, but the thing is that it would seem that this particular siding, let's talk about eastbound um, first, would have been probably controlled out of Greendale. So what would have happened is a freight train would have gone through Greendale, would have picked up basically a piece of paper which says, take the siding, uh, Roseville siding, and wait for train number whatever, train X. So they would have had that piece of paper and they would have followed those orders that have to come, it would be a mile from here, they'd have to stop before the switch. The, let's say the fireman would get out, we're talking now steam locomotive, get out, open the switch, 
climb back into the cab of the locomotive, train goes through, the whole train, up until including the caboose, which would pull in just beyond the switch. Somebody would get out of the caboose, let's say a brakeman, and then he, that brakeman would close the switch. So now the train is secure in the, in the siding and would wait for uh, whatever train would be coming along that had higher priority. And then that whole, after the train would come through, the passenger train, the whole process would have to be repeated at this end of the switch, or at this end of the siding with the switch, and then, uh, then the train would finally be able to proceed either to Port Morris or whatever its final destination would be. Now, the thing is with Greendale is, that, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when, we're, when we get to Greendale, which is basically our next stop. Um, Greendale was closed down in the 1930s. So there was no way for that, this particular siding to be controlled, quote unquote, because it was not electronic control, but controlled by train order. No way for this siding to be controlled. So um, although I don't have evidence at this point, I know that by 1943, I have a, a, a an employee's timetable from 1943. This siding is gone by that time. So it went out early. I'm suspecting that it probably went out at the same time that Greendale did because of the fact that there was no way to easily control or give train orders going into this particular siding. You might as well go all the way to Port Morris, for example. And probably as we, you know, as we looked at the siding at the old West Port Morris, it really didn't make any sense to have this siding here at all. I mean, why would, it, it, it's kind of puzzling why they built this siding. They might have used it, they might not have, but they, I suspect that sooner or later they figured out this was a really a superfluous siding. Same thing for the westbound siding. Uh, it, a train coming out of Port Morris, there's a siding there at Port Morris, they could have held the train there or sent it, uh, they could by train order out of the, the tower at Port Morris sent them a couple miles and stopped them here and had them shunted off onto this siding. Or they could have sent them as far as Greendale. Probably made more sense to do that. It doesn't make any sense why this siding existed, but it did. That's all we can say is that it actually existed. But it seems it probably had limited usefulness and as a result probably was torn out. Once again, I'm probably within a relatively short period of time after the cutoff was built. So that, that is Roseville siding. Uh, our next stop will be Greendale, which was actually the most, I'll say complicated siding because it actually had a, actually had a, a tower that when it was in operation, that actually could control the switches and, and control the sidings. Uh, which became later on electronically controlled, but we'll get into that as well. But in any case, um, next stop, Greendale. Here we are at Greendale Station. I haven't been here before. We're going to do a separate episode on, on Greendale. Originally called Greensville until 1915, 1916. They changed the name. There was a lot of stuff here at one time. And now, we're, since we're concentrating on sidings, there's actually two different types of sidings that were here at Greendale. Now, the main line, in this case would be eastbound, going this direction. Eastbound main would have been here. And this would have been the proximal location of the westbound main. And then there was uh, a 0.88 mile long westbound siding that started roughly in this spot. There would have been a, a switch off of the westbound main and went for uh, just a little under a mile in that direction. Now, east of the station, there was a, a siding that went off of the eastbound main and that continued for about a mile and a third well past the, t the tower, the interlocking tower, which you, you can't see. We'll visit that another time. Uh, and, and then that particular siding, the eastbound siding, the passing siding, connected back into the main just before you get to the Pequest fill, which is in that direction. 
Then there were actually a couple of freight sightings which came in here for various things. There was uh, some sort of stockyard. Um, there was a feed store over here, which uh, we, we saw in the episode about Johnsonburg, ironically, with uh, Jerry Cruz talking about that. You can see that there's a, a loading dock. There actually were tracks that went up into between the cement curb and the actual uh, cement dock, and there's actually a bumping block there. You can see that uh, over here just before you get to the station. Uh, the station actually was divided into two parts. The, in other words, there, there was a, a, a freight side, which was that side, which makes sense, was near the, 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 the loading dock. And then the passenger side was right over here. So that's where the passengers would go in and out. So the sidings themselves didn't overlap to any great extent. Uh, they, one went this way, one went that way, but in the middle there was just a, 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 a very short piece of overlap and um, where the switches would have been. Uh, the only thing else I can say about this at this point, because we want to save some discussion for when we come back here, um, Greendale to talk about uh, the station itself like we have with the other two stations that devoted other uh, separate episodes for them, is that there used to be a bridge right over here and this road um, it's County Road 611, or uh, Wolf's Corner Road. Uh, it used to cross over here on a, on a concrete bridge. That was torn out around 2002 or so and replaced by a, well, what would be a grade crossing when the, the cutoff is uh, reactivated. Uh, you, you see a number 12 on the side of the, the, the building here. Um, there's a restoration effort that's actually under, uh, underway right now, and um, a group, the, uh, the Lackawanna Cutoff uh, Historical Committee, which I urge you to, to, to join. Um, it's a closed group on Facebook, but uh, we're certainly more than happy to add uh, more members. Uh, but the reason why there's number 12 here is that uh, for any kind of um, service into here, electrical or otherwise telephone if we ever do that uh, you have to have a block number and this particular uh, piece of land didn't have uh, anything to designate it and long story short we were actually able to determine that it should be number 12 and um, uh, be block number 12 and that way the the local utility company which would be Jersey Central Power and Light would be able to have some place to be able to designate where they can send a bill to, presumably. Uh, that's the most important thing, I guess, from their perspective. But um, that's in the future, because that's something we're still working on uh, for, for Greendale, uh, for its restoration. And uh, we'll keep you up to date on any kind of significant developments that take place with that. So, oh, and I should also add, and I think I did point this out, but there, there was a siding in the back here, uh, which went to um, the, the stockyard and uh, so there was a, a track back here, a track over here and they ended up over by the the tower and then uh, switched into the main line. We'll show you a, a, a map which makes it a little bit easier to see than my trying to s describe it to you. In any case, uh, our next stop will be moving uh, westward to, to Johnsonburg. Um, you see, as what we're doing here is we're not only covering passing sightings, which were for the purpose of primarily freights pulling off to allow passenger trains to pass, but also freight sightings, which were used for uh, purposes of serving any kind of business that was uh, present at the stations. That was really the only place on the cutoff where there was actually any kind of, what we'll say, local type of freight operation um, in terms of uh, delivery. Uh, there was no other places on the cutoff where the, the, there was any kind of siding that was used for any other purpose other than uh, for allowing passage of trains or shunting them off to the side so a, um, a higher priority train could pass. So in any case, our next stop, Johnsonburg, and we'll take a look. We've been there before, but we'll uh, describe it just from the, the briefly as to what was there in, in terms of siding. Here we are at Johnsonburg Station. Uh, we've been here before. 
The station building would have been behind the photographer, who is, uh, by the way, my daughter Larissa. Uh, if you see an old photograph, this classic one of Johnsonburg facing towards me, uh, from, taken from that direction by the Lackawanna photographer, you would see the first building on a, a siding that comes off on, on a trailing switch from the eastbound main, eastbound main, westbound main trailing switch, uh, which means that the, uh, the train would have to go past on the switch on the eastbound main and then back into the switch uh, or through the switch into the siding. Uh, first there was an ice house. We're going back a ways. This is well before the days of refrigeration and then a, a creamery and they'd be right in this area right here. Um, and that's it. There wasn't a whole lot that was here. The, the, the station was there um, and there was some maintenance away uh, type of structure that was west of here, close to Armstrong Cut, which is in the distance if you look at uh, photographs of this particular area uh, in, in Johnsonburg. That, this particular Siding was not in operation probably much past somewhere in the 50s. I'm guessing um, The ice house would have been long gone certainly because refrigeration came into being uh, Certainly by the, the 20s and 30s and then the creamery maybe it lasted into the 50s, but that's about it that um, you know, Jerry Cruz references that, that in his uh, interview that we had of him uh, in the Johnsonburg segment uh, a while back. In any case, that, that's sort of what, basically what we have here, not, not too much. Certainly there's nothing here now, but there, um, at one time a modest amount of uh, structures here. Our next stop is going to be Johnsonburg Siding. Now they call it Johnsonburg Siding because, well, it's close to Johnsonburg, but it, it's not here. So we have to go a little bit of a distance to get there. So that's, that's basically our next stop, and uh, we'll take a look. We've, we've been there before, uh, although we've never really necessarily pointed out as being Johnsonburg siding, uh, but this time we will. Here we are at Silver Lake Road, where it crosses over the cutoff in Frillingheisen Township. The location, the west end of what was called Johnsonburg siding. Uh, we were here for the episode where we covered Blairstown and if you remember the section house that we looked for any kind of signs for for um, uh, Jacques Belay uh, who was the uh, the section supervisor for uh, this section of the cutoff uh, back in the uh, the teens and 20s this particular bridge, if you remember, there was the Lackawanna sign, which would have been on the rocks down below here. Uh, we never found that, unfortunately. This is the, the, the eastbound siding on this particular dual siding, because there was a westbound siding as well. The eastbound siding was Actually, the longest siding on the cutoff it was just a little bit under 1.4 miles. It was 1.38 miles to be exact. Um, and the westbound siding was a little bit under a mile, maybe about 0 0.8, 8 point, somewhere in there. Uh, so it, it uh, but the, why this particular siding was uh, uh, particularly long, not really sure. It may have been just, um, uh, due to topography, not really sure why they made that particular decision. Um, in, in terms of uh, number of cars it could have hold, it was like 160 some odd cars. Back in that day, if it were today, it would be significantly fewer because um, freight cars have become significantly larger than they were when the cutoff opened. So in any case, this is uh, the uh, Johnsonburg siding. Our next stop will be at Blairstown, the station, um, or actually the freight station I think we'll, this time we'll go to because uh, that's where the siding for Blairstown station was located.
Here we are at Blairstown, the old freight station. There's been an addition that's been put on in recent years. Uh, we'll show you a photo of the original building. The passenger station, which is a separate building, is just to the east on the same side of the tracks where the tracks were. Uh, right here is would be the westbound track and there's the eastbound track, which still has I don't see any leftover ties, but uh, more ballast, which would be not surprising because that's where the after post-1958 track was. It was on the eastbound side. You can't really see it here because there's so many trees, but looking up here, you can see this is Jones Cut, a huge cut, the side of a cliff that goes way up into the, seems like almost into the sky. Um, and that is right here at, uh, at Blairstown. So, um, that, uh, there was really only just the, the siding, which was used for various things um, as, as late as the 60s for the, the Yards Creek generating station construction. There was materials that came in for that, and over the years would have been other things. There was actually a, a coal dock which came off of this, which went off into that direction off and well all I can say was in that direction we'll show you a photo it's uh, of the map where that coal dock was shown I don't have any photos of the actual that I'm aware of that uh, actually showed that particular coal dock but um, and so that was it so this th this is Blairstown uh, our our next stop will be Blairstown siding which will be even further west of where we are here. And uh, that has an interesting artifact which we will be looking for and uh, hopefully we'll be able to show you. Here we are at Blairstown siding. We're a couple miles west of Blairstown and we did a little bit of an archaeological expedition. I'll note that last time we didn't do so well but this time we've hit pay dirt. We've actually managed to locate the foundation of the water tank that was here for the siding as you can see behind me. Uh, this was a 50-foot tall tank similar to ones that you would have seen at either Port Morris or even today at uh, East Stroudsburg. And within this particular cut there were four tracks. Uh, there was the westbound siding which is about 0.9 miles long which is would be the closest to me. And then behind the photographer would be the eastbound siding which was about 1.1 one, 1.2 miles long. There were water cranes that were supplied by this particular tank. In other words, the, the water was pumped from Cedar Lake, which is down the hill from here. It was pumped up to this tank and then presumably was distributed to these two water cranes, one on each end or near each end of the siding in each direction. We're more or less in the center of the siding. So about half mile in each direction or so, maybe not that quite that far, but a, a relatively um, large distance from this spot. There was no water crane located here, interestingly enough, so it had to be distributed somehow from here to the water crane, which is basically a, well, it looks like a crane like this. You know, it would be pulled down into the tender and it would deliver water that way. So here we are, Blairstown siding. Our next stop will be yet another passing siding. And I should add before we, I mention that is that the reason why there would be water here would be for steam engines. You know, after steam locomotives or steam in general disappeared from the Lackawanna in the early 50s, mainline steam particularly, uh, local Steam lo uh, use of steam locomotives for local freight persisted into the early 50s, but by 1950 or so, 
uh, pretty much all diesels would be um, pulling freight trains and, and as well as uh, passenger trains as well uh, on the, the Lackawanna. But um, in any case, the use of these water cranes would have been for steam locomotives because they're two things that you need in order to have a steam locomotive running. One is coal, the other one is water. So the water was a, a key component. So in any case, um, once again, Blairstown Siding, our next stop will be Haynesburg Siding, which is uh, located just west of its namesake, Haynesburg, Haynesburg, New Jersey, uh, where the Haynesburg Viaduct is located, but just a little bit beyond that. And uh, we'll take a look at what remains there of that particular location. Here we are at Haynesburg Siding, I'm literally sitting on ties from the eastbound main. Haynesburg Siding uh, was, and I'm looking at my trusty map here, uh, was, had one eastbound track and one westbound track in addition to the two main tracks. And according to my map, the eastbound section was approximately 0.93 miles long and that's about the same length as the westbound section. Now, what else can I add to uh, about Haynesburg? Well, the siding actually started on the eastbound side. This is in the direction of uh, the viaduct, Haynesburg Viaduct. The siding actually began right over the Lehigh and New England right-of-way, the right-of-way that was never used and then continued through here and then ended about three tenths of a mile before the Stark Road overpass. And it is seen at least until the 1943 employee timetable that I have. I'm not sure how much use it was getting because it, it Perhaps occasionally they, they might have sent a train into here. This would have been controlled out of uh, Slateford Tower, as a matter of fact. So it's possible this, since Slateford Tower remained in operation until 1950 or so, that this particular siding might have still seen some action uh, for eastbound trains that were going to be slow and needed to get out of the way of a... Um, I don't know about Phoebe Snow, but you know something, some passenger train um, up through the 19, early 1950s, at least until the time that the, the tower closed, at which point there would really be no, probably any reason to keep this particular siding in operation because there'd be no way other than to send allowing trains to go in by themselves, which wouldn't make any sense. They'd have to probably have some sort of train order to do so. And that would only, that you'd have to have an open tower to do that. So um, westbound, not really sure. Uh, have a photograph at the time before the construction was over of some cars sitting on Haynesburg siding. But, um, and there's also a photo I've, I've seen of a, a lone car sitting on Haynesburg siding from a shot taken from that direction. Um, but otherwise, you don't see much of Haynesburg siding. These sidings are kind of, in, in a sense, uh, played a very low-key low role in the operation of the cutoff. So, in any case, um, we only have one more siding to go to, and that's at Slateford. And that was an important siding because uh, that was the junction with the old road. And so, that's where we go next. Here we are on Slateford Siding, or what obviously was Slateford Siding at one point. In past episodes where we've shown you Slateford Junction, Slateford Junction is actually a little bit to our west here. Between us and there is where Slateford Bridge, Slateford Road Bridge used to be. It's now a fill-in, at least temporarily, since 1990. Um, four tracks wide. It actually could have been six tracks wide, but they didn't actually ever put in six tracks. 
Now, one thing I wanted to add, which I haven't mentioned so far, is that when the cutoff was built, there was actually a, a proposal, or at least Mr. Truesdale, President Truesdale, mentioned that there was the possibility that at some point in the future that the entire line would be triple tracked. In other words, that would be a third track for the whole line. That obviously was never done. And the question is, well, why didn't they do that instead of having basically 15 miles of disparate sidings? Why didn't they just put in one long 15 mile piece of track somewhere along, either from Port Morris back to maybe, well, that would have brought us almost over to Johnsonburg or maybe from Slateford here as far east as um, well, maybe around Greendale. Don't know. We don't know why they did that. It probably collectively would have been the same amount of work. In other words, when you make a, a fill four tracks wide, that means that's additional work you have to do. And if you have to do it here and you have to do it there and you have to do it somewhere else, collectively, you've probably done the same amount of work that if you just did it for three tracks for a, a considerable distance and, and instead of these different uh, non-connected sidings that had to be operated by um, hand-thrown switches with the exception of Greendell which was actually operated with the uh, with with the uh, the use of uh, um, out of a tower but basically where they could throw the switches out of the tower Slateford was the same thing you had uh, a number of uh, you had an interlocking at, at Slateford as well as Port Morris but everywhere in between Greendale and, and here, or uh, Greendale and Port Morris, you, you, those sidings were manually operated. And you had, to, as I explained, you had to stop the train and all that to, to be able to do that, as opposed to just putting the train onto one siding, let it go, and then it would be able to shunt back onto the main track, uh, assuming that the uh, that particular track was signaled and would, you know, somehow could be arranged so that you would, uh, that the engineer running the train would know that uh, if they could enter safely onto the, the main line. The other thing that, that the Lackawanna never apparently considered, which is kind of puzzling, that they did not reverse signal the, the westbound track. In other words, the signals on the cutoff eastbound would have faced eastbound. In other words, it would face toward the train that's going eastbound. and a westbound train the same way it would have seen the signals going in that direction. It was possible they could have, uh, shall we say, rewired or, or um, re-equipped the eastbound track so that signals would also um, face in the opposite direction, which would reverse signal the, the operation of that track so that you could run trains in either, either direction with signaling. Uh, they never did that. Why? We, we don't know. Um, it certainly would have added capacity. You possibly could have run trains, passenger trains around freight trains that were going up the, the grade on the, the eastbound side. You put them on uh, the westbound track and going in the wrong direction, so to speak, but you'd have signaling. They didn't do that. Um, so uh, don't know. These are solutions that are easy to come by now 100 years after the the line was opened, but it's just one of those things you wonder about. Uh, why did they build uh, Roseville siding? Don't know. After all these years, it really doesn't make any sense. And um, and these are one of those questions we'll just know, never know the answer to. Perhaps the Lackawanna didn't really understand how the line was going to operate in real time. Don't know. And of course, they couldn't have necessarily predicted that as things went from the 1920s, which is a boom era, to the 30s, which was a depression era. And then you have World War II. And then basically after World War II, a, a slow decline uh, to the point where uh, the Lackawanna had to merge with the Erie in 1960. And then the single tracking, which occurred just before the merger. And then the further um, rationalization, shall we call it, that took place with the uh, Greendale siding that was in the, the mid-60s, they actually cut back from 
a three mile siding to about a mile and a half siding at that point uh, back when it didn't look like there's gonna be a whole lot of operation of trains of any kind, either passenger or freight. That changed in the 70s as we've, we talked about in the uh, episode of the, the trains or rails under and over the cutoff. So, but in any case, these are things, these are unanswerable questions perhaps, but um, here we are we've, we, with perhaps more questions and answers, but we, we do our best. So, in any case, this is the end of part 11. I hope you look forward to part 12 on the Lackawanna Cutoff.